The Roman Empire reached its apex during the 2nd century CE. Already a superpower on three continents under the Flavian dynasty, Rome managed to become even more powerful and prosperous under the guidance of five rulers, later dubbed the Five Good Emperors by Niccolo Machiavelli. Partly by design, but mostly by happenstance, Roman emperors adopted accomplished grown men as their heirs. After, ironically, the adoption system came to an end due to Rome's first and only philosopher king, there was another succession crisis which led to the rise of the Severan dynasty. Septimius Severus and Caracalla had no time for the polite fiction of republican continuation and embodied the reality of Rome, which was at heart a military dictatorship. Surprisingly, the Severans survived the assassination of Caracalla despite the absence of an adult male member of the family. The teenage emperor Elagabalus, while endlessly fascinating and easily the most unique and eccentric of Rome's rulers, proved incapable of retaining power, and so the throne passed to his cousin, Severus Alexander. A conscientious, if not quite charismatic, leader, Severus Alexander tried to rule like one of the principes of old, but to no avail. When he opted to use diplomacy rather than war, his men felt disrespected and murdered him thus inaugurating the so-called Third Century Crisis, a series of civil wars, foreign invasions, plagues, and usurpations which lasted for some 50 years. However, that crisis of legitimacy, while rooted in what Tacitus termed the secret of the empire, goes beyond the scope of today's lecture. As for the culture of the High Roman Empire, this too exceeds the scope of this lecture and will receive a separate treatment in a subsequent video. Our story today begins with the fall of the Flavian dynasty. The fault for this fall lies almost entirely at the feet of the third Flavian ruler, Domitian. His father Vespasian had been a very successful ruler and he had established a new dynasty after the year of the four emperors. Domitian's older brother Titus had been something of a natural as princeps. He was an extraordinarily gracious and affable man he was an accomplished military commander, and because of his obvious qualities and because he was over a decade older than Domitian, Vespasian had groomed Titus and largely ignored Domitian's preparation, thinking that Titus would succeed and then have sons of his own who would inherit the empire while Domitian would lead something of a cadet branch. But Titus was only destined to rule for about two years before he succumbed to a sudden illness and thus left the Roman world in the hands of Domitian. Domitian is almost universally regarded as a bad emperor. He was not all that well prepared for the role, nor was he temperamentally suited for the role. Yet he would rule for some 15 years, and to his credit he was a hard worker. He gave the role all that he had, but ultimately he just didn't have the right temperament or the talent to be a successful emperor. Part of Domitian's problem is that he was deeply insecure, and he allowed others to see this insecurity. In order to try to bolster his resume and gain as much octoritas as possible, he actually held the consulship back to back to back to back to back to back to back from 82 to 88. This is something that no previous emperor had really done. Augustus had figured out early on that his position was obviously more prestigious than that of his colleagues, so he didn't really need to pile up the honors in a way which seemed excessive. To maintain the fiction of a functional republic, there has to be some spreading around of honors. Yet, Domitian apparently didn't quite grasp that subtlety. Domitian was also a man who had his moral failings. Despite not being a party boy, per se, he did do some things that caused public scandal. His most infamous deed, at least in his personal life, was impregnating his niece and then forcing her to get an abortion, which resulted in her death. Abortions in the ancient world were nowhere near as safe as abortions are in the modern world, and this story quickly spread. Despite everyone knowing that Domitian was not exactly a moral exemplar, he continued to behave that way in public, 
and tried to enforce traditional morality on others. One of the powers he added to the role of princeps was the position of censor for life. This addition to the powers of the princeps would not last, of course, but it was a characteristic of Domitian's rule, at least from the late 80s, and he would use this power to frequently expel senators on moral grounds. He also executed three Vestal Virgins for moral impropriety. And just so we're clear, this means that he was executing the Vestal Virgins because they might not have actually been virgins. And being a Vestal Virgin was dedicating yourself to Vesta and promising to not engage in sexual intercourse for the entire duration of your tenure. The other thing to remember about the Vestal Virgins is that all of them hail from the most aristocratic families in Rome, and so when you execute one of them, this makes some very powerful enemies. So Domitian came to be deeply hated by the Senate for his assumption of a regal heir. He also began to behave more like a king in the Hellenistic vein than like a princeps. And his insecurity led senators to figure out that if they wanted to advance themselves, one way to do it was to eliminate their rivals by suggesting to Domitian that the people they didn't like were plotting against his life. Domitian was very receptive to that kind of gossip, and he held a number of treason trials across the course of his reign. One interesting thing about Domitian is that he was the first emperor to successfully command an army in person since the time of Claudius. Claudius had not actually commanded in a meaningful sense, he had more or less J. Edgar Hoovered the operation in Britain by just showing up at the end to take credit, but Domitian did serve as a commander, and he did just fine. Nothing spectacular, but still, he did just fine. And because he had some success and also paid money to the troops, he was generally popular with the legions. And while the historical sources are typically very negative about Domitian, it's also worth noting that he, so far as we can tell, was also popular with the people as a whole. He was a great builder, and one of the benefits of building lots of structures in Rome and throughout the Roman Empire is that this created a number of construction jobs, which typically paid relatively well and didn't require that much special skill. So this was effectively an economic stimulus of sorts. Ultimately, Domitian was hated by the people who had to actually deal with him as he became increasingly paranoid. And it was actually his household staff, his freedmen, who ended up assassinating him at the age of 44. Domitian, despite being 44 years old, had not successfully had children. And so when he died, there was no Flavian to take his place. And Rome was potentially about to face a similar crisis to what it had faced when Domitian's father had established the Flavian dynasty all the way back in 69. However, Rome was about to get very, very lucky. When news reached the Senate that Domitian was dead, the senators did not try to disguise their glee, and in fact they quickly held a session where they voted to condemn Domitian's memory. They then decided to try to fill the void and appoint a new emperor on their own. Now typically, at least in the crisis of 30 years earlier, the legions had held all the cards and had created all four of the men who would rise up after Nero. However, in this case, the Senate decided to take the initiative and try to establish a new precedent. And so they chose one of their own senior members, the 66-year-old Marcus Cocius Nerva, as the new princeps. Shockingly, the legions were willing to accept this, although it is worth noting that Nerva's position was deeply unsettled at first, and a lot of people were fearful that there would be a revolt any day. Nerva had one thing going for him above all else. Not only was he an older gentleman, but he was not in the best health, which meant that he was something of a stopgap measure, and he also had no children or obvious heirs. So for that reason alone, the ambitious generals of Rome were willing to accept him and then await their turn. Nerva was a political survivor, and he was an insider who managed to even ingratiate himself with the late Domitian. In fact, he seems to have been 
one of the mission's more trusted advisors to the extent that the mission trusted anyone. He didn't really have a viable constituency, however. There wasn't a lot of support for Nerva outside of the Senate. So to earn popularity, Nerva decided to pay a donative, that is, a bonus to the Praetorian Guard and to the legions. And he also decided to allocate 60 million sesterces to allow landless men in Italy to acquire farms. So he was trying to win both military and popular support, Although he was a well-established senator, we have to remember that he was a bit more of a kind of behind-the-scenes guy in terms of how he operated politically, and so he might not have been a household name prior to the Senate putting him up as the new princeps. In terms of institutional development, Nerva established something called the Alimenta, and this is basically a complex child support system where the emperor would give out low interest loans to landowners and then collect the interest on those loans and use that to fund a monthly stipend for poor children, especially for orphans. This fund typically favored boys, but that should come as no surprise to anyone who's familiar with the gender politics of the Roman world. And there are various theories about what it was intended to do. Some people believe that the Alimenta was meant to try to boost the population of Italy. But given that the population had been growing naturally for a while now since Rome had established peace, that seems rather unlikely and certainly unnecessary. But Nerva's reign ultimately boiled down to one question. And so he had one decision to make that would make or break his reputation in the long run. Could he choose someone as his heir who could prevent a civil war? Could he navigate the troubled waters of the succession and spare the Roman world of bloodshed? It turns out that Nerva, as a political survivor, was able to pull that off. So effectively what he did is he figured out that just like in 69, whenever he was about to die, the generals on the frontier who held the biggest armies would all vie for power. And the man who either had the largest army or the most military skill would most likely prevail. So, he looked at the men who held commands at that moment, and he figured out that there was one man who had a pretty sizable force and also was known as the ace general of the time. And he decided that guy should be his heir. That man, of course, was Trajan. So, Nerva adopted Trajan shortly before he died, and he lived just long enough to secure a smooth transition of power to Trajan. However, it was mostly a testament to Trajan's prestige and to the level of military um, support that he had that none of the other generals tried to contest Trajan's elevation. But it must be said in Nerva's uh, defense, or to his credit, that he did make the right decision since Trajan would go on to be one of the truly great Roman emperors. Marcus Ulpius Trianus, or Trajan as he is typically called in English, was 44 years old when he ascended to power in January of 98. It is a testament to the level of respect that he held in the minds of his contemporaries and of his soldiers that there were no challenges to his power even though he waited until October of 99 to go to Rome and receive the acceptance of the Senate. During this time, he toured the Rhine and Danube legions. He was both filling out their loyalty and inspecting them to make sure that they were ready for hard and sustained campaigning. Since he was already in his mid-40s, Trajan knew that his window of opportunity to lead men into battle and achieve great glory was finite, and so he wanted to make the best possible use of the time he had. And so he would. But we should not think that Trajan was a purely military figure, as he was actually quite proficient in all of the areas that a princeps could be expected to have to perform in. Trajan knew that Domitian had fallen in large part because of his very poor relations with the Senate, and so he attempted to reestablish friendly relations with the Senate, which wasn't too difficult since he was already pretty popular in that body and had been a member for years. So this is something that came rather naturally to him. 
So while he was comfortable giving commands in the field and being a strict disciplinarian, he could also be charming when he wanted to be, and so he always got along well with the Senate. No real problems there. Trajan was a generous ruler for the most part. He increased military pay in order to win over the men and increase their morale. He expanded Nerva's aliamenta. When he won great battles, and he won quite a few, he would put on lavish triumphal games, which would, of, car of course, bring him great popularity with the people, since this brought about a lot of entertainment and free food. And he even decided to use all of the gains from his campaigns, in some cases, to give out cash bonuses to the common people on a few different occasions. And of course, these would be very helpful, especially to the marginally employed people who were a large part of the population of the city of Rome itself. Trajan was someone who was also a, an administrator who was really dedicated to stamping out corruption and making sure that his provincial governors were living up to the ideals of Roman government. We have letters between Trajan and Pliny the Younger where the two are discussing various problems, most famously the problem of what to do with Christians. But beyond that, Trajan was also insistent that Pliny should investigate some possible grifting at Nicaea, where there were two aqueducts the city had financed and neither project had been finished, and now the residents of the city were without water. So Trajan specifically instructs Pliny the Younger to go out and investigate this corruption and punish those responsible for bilking the good people of Nicaea. Trajan, of course, though, is mostly known for his conquest. And he's almost always considered to be one of the top five or so Roman generals of all time because of the conquests that he made. Some of the conquests that he made were not done in person. His legions expanded Rome's holdings into Caledonia, which is now modern Scotland. And he himself led a successful war against Parthia, which led to the annexation of most of Mesopotamia. So Rome expanded all the way to the Tigris and beyond at one point under the leadership of Trajan. He also annexed an area of Arabia. And this began sort of the long-term political development and state-building efforts of the Arab people, which would ultimately, of course, contribute to the Arab conquest of the early Middle Ages. But Trajan's most important and most difficult conquest was against Dacia. This was a rising kingdom north of the Danube, in today's Romania primarily. Militarily, this is one of the most impressive campaigns in Roman history, and certainly the most impressive campaign that Trajan ever embarked upon. Dacia is very mountainous, and Trajan, just like some Romans before him, really feared that if Dacia were allowed to go unchecked, that it would use its great mineral wealth to become a threat to Rome. And so he decided to embark on this great campaign, and it required him to literally tunnel through the mountains in order to get at his enemies. But despite this great engineering challenge, the Roman legions were equal to the task. This was the high tide of Rome, after all, and especially the high tide of the Roman legions. And so Trajan's men were able to fight their way through the mountains and conquer and annex Dacia. Dacia was destined to only be in Roman hands until the year 270. However, Romanization there was able to take hold pretty thoroughly, and modern-day Romanian, the language, is a Romance language. Even though, of course, there was only a Roman presence there for about 150 years. So that in itself is a testament to just how much effort and planning Trajan put into both the conquest and the settlement of Dacia. One of the most interesting monuments in Rome, and something that is of great historical significance for modern scholars, is Trajan's Column in Rome. And this column depicts in great graphic detail Trajan's conquest of Dacia. For people who are curious about how Roman soldiers dressed, or what equipment they used, or how they conducted some of their affairs when it came to laying siege or moving supplies around, Trajan's Column is a treasure trove of information. It's almost perfectly preserved. And 
much of the information that we have on what legionaries looked like in Rome's prime comes from Trajan's column. So its significance is very hard to overstate. Roman military history would be much diminished without Trajan's column. Trajan, of course, would die in 117. He had a stroke, and he had not really designated a clear heir. Trajan was married, but he had no children. Some people believe that he may have been gay. And the throne ultimately passed to his cousin, Hadrian, under slightly suspect circumstances. When Trajan had his near-fatal stroke, he quickly adopted Hadrian and then proceeded to die conveniently. This led to widespread speculation, of course, that the adoption was faked by Hadrian and the people around Trajan. But the way that Hadrian really earned the hatred of the Senate was by sending assassins forward to murder four men who were very prominent. Hadrian had only come into prominence in the later years of Trajan's reign after he had won a couple battles, and so he knew that there were men in Rome who had more impressive resumes. So rather than trying to build up his own credentials through deeds, he decided to preemptively take out those four men, and then he set foot in Rome after that, after he had told the Senate effectively through his deeds that he would not tolerate dissent. From this point forward, the Senate had a seething hatred of Hadrian, but they never did anything about it. And so he proved to be a strong and capable leader, even if he was not exactly what we would call a good person. Hadrian had some pretty big character flaws. He was known for being very abrasive and aggressive. He was a hard person to be in a room with. He was borderline insufferable. In many ways, he reminds me of the Roman equivalent of Lyndon Baines Johnson, someone who was very capable, yet was extremely difficult to work for. Lyndon Baines Johnson, of course, was president in the 60s, and he famously would force staffers to stand in the bathroom and take notes while he was defecating. Hadrian was about on that level, except worse. Hadrian tended to offend everyone who had to be in a room with him, and so he and his followers would always make sure to send gifts afterwards to try to make up for whatever insults Hadrian had consciously or unconsciously inflicted upon the person who had been with him. So this helped to keep people content enough to not attempt to murder him. So, to his credit, Hadrian was aware of his flaws and did take some countermeasures to offset them. Hadrian was a highly cultured man, he was a full participant in the Second Sophistic. You can tell from his statue that he had a philosopher's beard, and he thought of himself as being an accomplished rhetorician. Uh, that is to say that he loved to argue, and this, of course, was one of the contributing factors to why he was such a difficult person. He also was somewhat restless. He went on two grand tours of the entire empire over the course of his reign, which was deeply unusual. And it also wasn't necessarily the best idea, because touring the empire put a massive strain on local economies. So Hadrian, being emperor, had a large entourage, including his Praetorian Guard, and this meant that everywhere he visited, people would be displaced. Um, food prices would skyrocket as food would have to be allocated for the emperor and his massive entourage. And so he effectively brought misery wherever he went, but he seems to have either been unaware with that, of that or just unconcerned. His reason for doing the Grand Tour twice is that he was looking to change up some of the arrangements along the frontier and really just to rationalize and consolidate Rome's frontier after all of the great conquest of Trajan. Hadrian also, during these tours, would stop by legionary camps and drill his men. Although by this point he was at least middle-aged, Hadrian was still a very vigorous and active man, and so he would try to shame younger men if they couldn't keep up with him. So this is one way in which he kept his soldiers in shape and ready for war. 
He also was known for taking a lot of care to make sure that they had the best possible equipment. And so, in all likelihood, although the legions really reached their peak of performance under Trajan, it was actually under Hadrian when they were the most ready for war. Hadrian's sort of defensive philosophy, I guess you could say, is best exemplified by his most famous construction, Hadrian's Wall in Britain. He built Hadrian's Wall in 121. This is built along the narrowest point in the uh, main island of Britain. And it was to separate Roman Britain from Caledonia or Scotland. Hadrian's Wall was extraordinarily well built, and most of it is still intact even today. It is possible to hike along the 73 miles of the wall and from everything I've heard, it is one of the best things to do if you happen to be in Britain. So, Hadrian in general, though, did this across the empire. He also withdrew from most of Mesopotamia, abandoning most of Trajan's conquests there, since he felt that those conquests were too far removed from Rome's centers of power to truly be uh, feasible from a defensive standpoint. Hadrian was a man who was full of life, even if he mostly just inspired angers and anger in the people who had to be around him. But ultimately, his spirits would be crushed starting around 130 or so. It's worth mentioning that Hadrian was, so far as we can tell, purely gay. And the only person that he ever loved was Antinous, a much younger Greek man. Antinous drowned in the Nile on one of Hadrian's tours. And he was so grief-stricken that he decided to start a cult for Antinous, where he declared Antinous as a hero, which is one step below a god, and he tried to force this cult on the entire empire. He also tried to increase the level of Greek and Roman cultural presence among the non-Greek and Roman populations of the empire, and this led to the Bar Kochba revolt when he tried to force a Roman colony in the center of Jerusalem. The Bar Kochba revolt, like all of the Jewish revolts, was long, tedious, hard-fought, and highly expensive. Judea was the poorest province in Rome, or damn near, and so any war fought in Judea was a drain on the treasury, which ultimately didn't benefit Rome in any conceivable way. So Hadrian was really chastened by this failure and depressed by the fact that one of his projects had backfired. As 136 rolled into 137, Hadrian's health began to decline noticeably, and so he began to search for an heir. He found a distinguished general and adopted that man as his son, but that general happened to fall ill suddenly and then die before Hadrian. So Hadrian was forced to look for a second successor, and this time, he decided to pick a senator named Antoninus. It doesn't appear that he was super enamored with Antoninus, but basically saw him as a stopgap measure until a young man that he had his eye on would be ready. He adopted Antoninus as a son on the condition that Antoninus, in turn, should adopt a young Marcus Aurelius. He also had Antoninus adopt Lucius Verus, the son of his late heir, in order to make sure that he was taken proper care of and that the memory of the man he had so honored would be preserved. So Hadrian effectively set up an artificial family and had a son and grandson lined up to succeed him when he eventually passed away in 138. When Hadrian's body reached room temperature, the Senate made no attempt to disguise the fact that they absolutely despised the man, and they even tried to convince Antoninus to allow them to condemn Hadrian's memory. However, Antoninus felt that he was duty-bound to honor his adopted father, and so he insisted upon Hadrian being deified. Because he showed such devotion to a man that he barely knew, the Senate decided to give him the cognomen Pius. This, of course, is the root word for the English word pious, and while it can mean showing respect and reverence for the gods, in the Roman context it almost always meant showing respect for one's family, particularly one's father. 
And so Antoninus got off to a good start for that reason alone. The fact that he had shown a respect for what had come before, and he also showed that he was dedicated to upholding Rome's political order in a way that would be friendly and conducive to harmony. Antoninus Pius would be very, very popular with the Senate, unlike his adopted father. He also did not leave Italy during the entire 23 years of his reign, which of course is a complete 180 reversal from what both Trajan and Hadrian had done before him. Aside from authorizing some renewed offensives in the Caledonia and building a new wall in the north called the Antonine Wall, which would later then be abandoned by Marcus Aurelius, Antoninus Pius oversaw very few wars. He reigned from 138 to 161, and this is one of the most peaceful, almost boring times in Roman history. Very little happened, and while he did take some measures that are important, he really didn't have all that many earth-shattering policy changes. He actually did make some mild steps to try to alleviate the suffering of slaves and to try to alleviate poverty in Italy, and did some other things, but none of his programs were all that transformative, and so his reign was just this kind of almost golden summer of Roman history, where things just continued to try to go along and even improve a little bit here and there, with no great interruptions and no major crises. So that has led to some debate as to whether Antoninus Pius was merely lucky or whether he was good. Most likely it's some combination of both. Because this man who had no military credentials whatsoever never faced any challenger. And it would appear that he must have been pretty savvy in his appointments to make that happen. It has sometimes been estimated that as emperor... Antoninus did not come within 50 or 100 miles of a legionary camp during the entire 23 years he was on the throne. He was also renowned for being gentle and for being humane. As I mentioned earlier, he did take some limited measures to help slaves and the poor, something that most of his predecessors had not really bothered with. Sure, Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian had all supported the Aliamenta, but Antoninus Pius would take it a little bit further. And because of how gentle he was and how much attention he paid to them, the Senate would for many, many years consider Antoninus Pius to be the greatest of the Roman emperors. And it would appear that not only did they think very highly of him as a ruler, but they truly did love him. Now, it was very common, of course, for senators to deliver panegyrics for emperors and to praise them highly. But so far as we can tell, when it came to Antoninus Pius, this was very much genuine. And actually, there's a famous letter to Marcus Aurelius where one of the senators admits that when he was praising Hadrian, he was more or less lying. But when he was praising Antoninus Pius, he was being completely sincere. While the Roman Empire reached its territorial peak under Trajan, in terms of peace and prosperity, and probably also population total, the Roman world reached its peak under Antoninus Pius. This would have been the greatest time to be alive in Rome or to visit the empire, because everything was peaceful, prosperous, and almost every place in the Roman world was in good repair. And so this, if you, had, if you were a time traveler and you wanted to visit Rome and see it at its best, you would want to aim for some time during the reign of Antoninus Pius. And he became so synonymous with success, peace, prosperity, and all that is good, that many subsequent emperors, including all of the Severans, would adopt the name Antoninus as a part of their increasingly long litany of names because they wanted to associate themselves with the success of Antoninus and the era over which he presided. When Antoninus Pius died, Marcus Aurelius decided that it would be best to share power with his adopted brother Lucius Verus. 
This arrangement actually worked well for both men, even though it was somewhat awkward, and I have to think that Hadrian had intended for Marcus to take the throne, or if something were to happen to him, for Lucius Verus to be the backup, but instead they became co-rulers. Both of these men had other interests aside from ruling, and I'm sure that the peace and prosperity of the Antonine era led them to think that the job wouldn't require full-time dedication. So, the arrangement that they set up was for Marcus to largely be the domestic policy guy, who could then spend the rest of his time studying philosophy, whereas Lucius Verus liked the party some, but he would go and investigate things in the provinces or command men when necessary. So, this was a great fit for both men. There was a little bit of headbutting, and they did have some differences of perspective, but for the most part, because this arrangement fit so well with their lifestyle preferences, it meant that they got along really, really well. However, in 169, as the intensity of the job was beginning to pick up due to some events we'll talk about, Varus suddenly grew ill and died, and now Marcus Aurelius would have to forge ahead as the sole ruler of the Roman world, and now, for the first time in his life, as a man in his late 40s, he would be facing serious adversity that he had never really imagined possible. The thing that really got him through this adversity was philosophy. Marcus Aurelius was a lifelong devotee of Stoic philosophy, something that he tried to study every single day and to practice as much as humanly possible. Many Romans before him had been influenced by Stoicism, but none of them had really poured himself into Stoic thought and practice more than Marcus Aurelius. In fact, I think it's safe to say that he saw himself on a certain level as something like the philosopher king envisioned by Plato in the Republic. Although, of course, he would be a little bit hesitant to claim that because he was a Stoic and not a Platonist, but still, Marcus Aurelius is in many ways the closest thing that the ancient world ever saw to a true philosopher king. And in fact, as we'll see, being emperor did not prohibit him from trying to practice philosophy, as he kept a book called The Meditations with him, which was his journal where he would basically write about his struggles to remain humble and to not let the pressures of the job get to him and to practice stoicism every day as pressures mounted, and crisis followed crisis. The Meditations, which was originally intended to be a private work written in Greek for his personal use, has survived, and not only is it one of the best-known works of the Second Sophistic, the best-known work of Stoicism, but it is also one of the very few things that we have written by a sitting emperor which has survived to the present. Most of the rest of the things that we have written by sitting emperors come to us from Julian the Apostate. As a ruler, Marcus seems to have looked to his adopted father Antoninus Pius as a model, but unfortunately for him, his reign would not allow for that model to really work. He would have to leave Italy frequently, especially after 168, when a series of unfortunate events would unfold. All the way back in 166, Marcus was forced to face off against the Marcomanni and various other Germanic tribes who crossed the Danube and threatened both Italy and Greece. In fact, things got bad enough at one point that one of the tribes actually managed to make it into Attica and burn down some of the temples at Eleusis. So, Marcus really said his work cut out for him, and for the first time in his life, he found himself donning a uniform and commanding men in person, something that he had never envisioned for himself. And this would occupy the rest of his reign. As the war was wrapping up in 180, this is when Marcus would fall ill and die. So he never got to return to peace before his death at the age of 58. The other major challenge that Marcus faced is perhaps much more important than the Marcomannic War, and that, of course, is the Antonine Plague. I don't mean to downplay the importance of the Marcomannic Wars, 
as this was a major indication that the pressures on the frontier were beginning to build and that Rome's enemies were becoming stronger in relative terms and that Rome would soon be threatened with serious invasions. But the Antonine Plague, I believe, is the more significant event of the two. So far as we know, based on what we have been able to study of the virus, the Antonine Plague was either an early and highly virulent form of smallpox or the measles. Most scholars tend to think that it's smallpox. But viruses, of course, evolve very quickly, and this means that if you find an ancient form of a modern virus, while you can recognize kinship with a modern virus, a lot of things change from how it's transmitted to a lot of the symptoms. So the surviving descriptions that we have of the Antonine Plague don't quite match any modern virus. Most of those descriptions, of course, came from the Dr. Galen, who was alive and active at this time. And so for that reason, sometimes the Antonine Plague is called the Plague of Galen. Of course, it's called the Antonine Plague rather than, say, the Aurelian Plague because one of the many names of Marcus Aurelius was Antoninus, and we've already discussed the reason why that was the case. Scholars estimate that this early pandemic killed at least 10% of the total Roman population, although I've read elsewhere that it may have been up to 30% of the total Roman population, and that the places most heavily affected were the Roman army camps and the cities. One of the sources in a passage which is no doubt exaggerated claims that the Roman army was all but devastated by the plague and that this is why the Marco Mani and their allies were able to fight for so long and achieve so much success. However, all things considered, the impact of this plague is still debatable and scholars continue to debate the role that it played in destabilizing Roman politics. Effectively, some scholars have tried to link this plague, which mostly broke out between 165 and 180, with a few recurrences later, including one in 189, and they've tried to relate those outbreaks with the 3rd century crisis that came later. It's a hard task. It's not necessarily clear if that is the correct way to look at this or not. However, that view also applies to Eastern history where a scholar of ancient China, Rafe de Crespigny, actually believes that the disease originated in Han China and may have contributed to a lot of the political instability which led to the Yellow Turban Rebellion and the subsequent downfall of the Han Dynasty and the Three Kingdoms era. The Yellow Turban Rebellion was led by a man who claimed to have magical powers, including the power to heal, and if there were people dying of a plague, then a folk healer who claimed to have magical powers would of course be an appealing leader. So at any rate, um, the Antonine Plague definitely did a good deal of damage, but it's unclear exactly how much. What is certain is that this plague, combined with the Marcomonic Wars, really served to put Marcus Aurelius in an early grave and also put a big strain on Rome that it had not endured in quite some time. So although Marcus Aurelius is considered one of the five good emperors, it is worth noting that, and this is not really his fault in any way, but his reign was not necessarily peaceful or all that great. So while he is one of the so-called five good emperors, that does not mean that he was presiding over some Saturnine state of uh, goodness and prosperity and milk and honey and all of that. One thing that Marcus Aurelius did that no emperor had done in 80 years was to marry and procreate and thus leave a male heir. When he died in 180, he was succeeded by his young son Commodus, thus bringing the system of succession by adoption to an abrupt and permanent end. For whatever reason, the Romans do not seem to have ever considered bringing the system back which makes me think that it was purely a product of happenstance and that it was never really done intentionally. 
Commodus was not very much like his father. He probably didn't know his father terribly well since his father was busy fighting the Marcomanni and he ascended to the throne as a teenager. Commodus as emperor is slightly underrated in terms of his performance. He actually was able to restore peace after his father had finished the war, but he did run into trouble domestically with the Senate. Commodus, like many young or unproven emperors, was a bit insecure, and so he wanted to really express his octoritas and his superiority to the Senate, and the way that he did this was to adopt sort of a heroic or divine air by really trying to put himself on a pedestal above his fellow senators and making it clear that he was not one of them. One of his favorite practices was to dress up as Hercules and then berate the Senate in that garb while wearing a cape and then pounding his club on things. This is something that caused senators to laugh at him and to try to um, disguise that laughter by putting part of their cloak in their mouth. But Commodus was a man who thought that what he was doing was not only elevating his stature in the eyes of the Senate, but also showing off his physique. Commodus was a, apparently a fine athlete, and he was known as being an exceptionally handsome person. So unlike his father, who really put all of his, I guess, identity into his philosophical undertakings, Commodus thought of himself first and foremost as something of a professional athlete. And to that end, one of his favorite activities, when he wasn't dressed as Hercules and uh, talking to the Senate, one of the other things he liked to do was to appear as a gladiator in the Flavian Amphitheater. And what he would do is fight in extremely rigged matches. So he never really fought a full-strength opponent. If he did fight someone under quote-unquote fair circumstances, it was only someone who was old or sickly or had a limb missing or something like that. He was known to fight people, quote-unquote, who were tied up and just beat them to death with clubs or to spear animals that had been poisoned or something like that. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that he appeared in the arena some 490 times. And of course, he was undefeated, but he never really won any meaningful contest, of course, since they were all deeply rigged. Yet, despite how goofy and awkward that sounds to us, this apparently got over with the Roman people. And Commodus seems to have been fairly popular with the population as a whole because he was such a consummate entertainer. Nero also, by the way, was a popular emperor with the people and for much the same reason that he was willing to entertain them with pageantry and games. While Commodus was not on good terms with the Senate, his downfall actually came from his own household, much like Domitian's. His closest associates late in his reign, so for the last couple of years, were his mistress, one of his chamberlains, and his Praetorian prefect. His mistress was in the bedroom and she happened to uncover a letter that Commodus was working on where he was listing the people he planned to have executed in the new year, and all three of their names were on it, so she got the Chamberlain and the Praetorian Prefect together, and they murdered him. This, of course, would lead to a new succession crisis since the 29-year-old Commodus had no children or close male relatives. And this would lead to a succession crisis which was actually greater than the year of the four emperors, because now we're about to face the year of the five emperors. Once Commodus was dead, the Praetorian Guard decided to head off the Senate and the legions by appointing a new emperor. They figured that they were the best people for the job since they were supposed to be protecting this guy. So they chose Pertinax, a senator who was the son of a freedman. As a son of a freedman, his status and his pedigree were less than that of anyone else who had ever held the office before, and so this represents something of an evolution in the understanding of what it took to be Prenkeps. Pertinax did attempt to make some reforms. Commodus had largely let the guard become ill-disciplined, 
and he had also let a lot of other things lapse as well. So Pertinax is effectively trying to get back to what we might think of as the practices of good government as they had existed a decade or so before. And the Praetorian Guard quickly decided that they weren't interested in doing more work, so they realized they had made a mistake in choosing Pertinax, who was not willing to be their puppet, and so they killed him, and then took the incredibly bold step of going before the Senate and offering the Empire at auction. In many ways, in terms of Rome's dignity, this is the absolute low point. This is far worse in many ways, or at least more embarrassing, than the sacks of many of Rome's major cities in its last centuries. A senator named Didius Julianus, pictured here, decided that he was willing to pay money to become emperor, and so he bought the throne and ruled for 66 days. During that time, he tried his best to get the Praetorian Guard to return to order, but when he was faced against a Danubian general named Septimius Severus, he found that either the Praetorians were unable to hold their own in combat with a real legion, or if you follow the accounts of most modern scholars, they believe that actually the Praetorian Guard just simply deserted and left the Emperor Didius Julianus high and dry to be arrested and executed. In the account of Cassius Dio, the Praetorian Guard fought, but just got completely steamrolled by real soldiers. So Septimius Severus took control of Rome. He also had control of the Danubian legions, but the man in charge of the Rhine legions revolted, and also the general in Syria revolted, and so Septimius Severus would have several more years of fighting before he could really establish himself and a new dynasty. On the right, we see a monument that Septimius Severus commissioned at his hometown at Leptis Magna in North Africa, which celebrates his triumph and ascension to the throne. The niceties established by Augustus to pretend that the Republic was still alive and well did a pretty good job of concealing the reality that Rome was a military dictatorship. And this is something, of course, which was first observed by Tacitus. Under Septimius Severus, this basic reality that Rome was a military dictatorship was on full display, as he would rule in a manner different than any previous emperor. There have been previous rulers who had seen themselves as being more monarchical than most, people like Commodus who dressed up as Hercules or uh, people would put on some regal airs, even starting with Caligula. But no one had just openly said, I am in charge because the legions put me there. And no one else had ever advised his sons, just ignore the Senate, they don't matter, give all of your money and attention to the legions. But Septimius Severus did exactly that. He also represented a huge shift in who could potentially be seen as a viable emperor. His family actually came from North Africa, and his native language was Punic. That is to say that Septimius Severus was in fact a Carthaginian, at least by birth. However, of course, he did speak Greek and Latin, but both of them he spoke with a fairly heavy accent, and everyone in Rome was aware that Septimius Severus had ancestors who fought against Rome in the Second Punic War. As for Septimius's wife, she actually hailed from Syria, and unlike many prominent people from Syria at that time, she was not from one of the Greek families that had settled there. Rather, she was actually of Arabic origin. And so, Septimius Severus's family was the most exotic dynasty to date, and neither side of it could claim to be ethnically Roman. So this was a massive departure from previous assumptions about what it took to be emperor, since now being Roman in identity was completely irrelevant. The only claim Septimius Severus had was that he was a senator. And, of course, he had been a citizen because of his uh, birth in North Africa, but uh, he himself was not ethnically Roman, nor was his wife. And so, at this point, almost every boundary to preventing someone from becoming emperor had been removed, and yet there were very few boundaries which prohibited 
generals from becoming successful in terms of uh, citizenship or other barriers. So, really, this was a huge moment in Roman history that I think often gets overlooked or downplayed. Another important development in the Severan period is that the women of the family were incredibly important. This was highly unusual in Roman politics. If you go back to the Julio-Claudian dynasty, the women had played a role, but ultimately they didn't really possess that much power. Under the Severan dynasty, the women of the family would exercise an immense amount of power and influence. And this would especially be the case with the last two Severan rulers, who were both very young and who had very important mothers and grandmothers. Julia Domna, Septimius' wife, was also a strong figure in her own right, even though her husband was an overbearing and fairly uh, dictator-like figure, Julia Domna was still a great presence in her own right, and in fact, when she moved to Rome, she started a literary circle and began to become one of the great patronesses of the era. One of the people that she patronized was none other than Philostratus, the man who famously wrote a life of Apollonius of Tiana based on a document that the Empress secured for him, and he also would later go on to write biographies of various intellectuals from the past. The other women of the family would actually prove to be even more important than Julia Domna, and we'll talk about them in a little while. Septimius famously told his sons that the Senate didn't matter to give all of his attention to the legions, and he even expanded the army by creating three new legions, giving generous donatives, and increasing the base pay of the legionaries once again. Many traditional-minded historians have said that this was the point where all discipline broke down in the Roman armies, and that they were paid too much, and that's why they became so unruly. I'm not sure that I agree with that assessment, Part of the reason why he was offering them more pay is because, as we noted with the uh, Marcomonic Wars, the pace of operations on the frontiers was becoming quicker as pressures built, and so soldiers were being called upon to do more and more fighting, and they expected to be compensated more and more for that fighting. Unlike most other emperors who didn't have much of a tie to Africa, Septimius Severus decided that Rome should penetrate deeper into the farmlands of North Africa, and so that's what the Romans did. He also tried to conquer Scotland in person, but while he was on campaign, he happened to fall ill, and he died in 211. I'm not sure if I buy the argument, but there are some scholars who believe that Septimius Severus was actually the emperor who reigned at the time when Rome was at its maximum territorial extent. I'm pretty sure it's actually the reign of Trajan, but I have never compared the exact square mileage, so I cannot say for sure. But at any rate, Septimius Severus was a conqueror, and he did use the army that he built up to try to conquer more land in the name of Rome. On the previous slide, you may have noted the family portrait, where you have a mother, a father, and two sons. One of the sons has his face scrubbed out. These two boys are Caracalla and Geta, the children of Septimius Severus and Julia Domna. Caracalla was the oldest son and the intended heir. However, Septimius intended for his two sons to share power but Caracalla was not interested in that arrangement. So he quickly moved to murder his brother and then condemn his memory. And that is why, on that image and others, where Geta's face is featured, it has been removed by force. Caracalla's reign started off by killing his own brother, and it didn't really get much less bloody from there. He would reign from 211 to 217, and he was a frightening character. All accounts of Caracalla portray him as tyrannical and cruel, and someone who was to be feared. If you look at his bust, he just happens to look exactly like one would imagine a bully to look, and apparently that was exactly his personality, so at least his looks and personality were complementary of one another. I happen to believe that if he had been alive when there was a live-action Beauty and the Beast, he would be a shoe-in for the role of Gaston 
the town bully. Caracalla, however, despite being somewhat thuggish, was also a mostly effective emperor. While cruel, he was competent. One of his greatest achievements was building the Baths of Caracalla at Rome, which became the second biggest bathhouse, and it would become a major public amenity for years to come. It was deeply popular with the people of the city. But his best-known deed by far, and one of the most meaningful legal changes that Rome would see during the imperial period, was the Antonine Constitution. And yes, once again, the Severans would adopt the name Antoninus as part of their name to try to piggyback on the reputation of Antoninus Pius. But Caracalla passed the Antonine Constitution, and the effect of this was to spread full Roman citizenship to all the free subjects of the empire. Before, Roman citizenship had only been spread in dribs and drabs across the course of the imperial period, and it hadn't reached many parts of the empire, but now Caracalla was granting it to everyone in the Roman realm who was not a slave. So this is unprecedented, and it also really changes the relationship between Rome and many of its inhabitants. At the time of his death, Caracalla was in the middle of collecting a large force to invade the Parthian Empire when he was slain. What happened is that he went to the side of the road to relieve himself, so he was peeing, and then one of his soldiers who had a grievance ran up behind him and murdered him. This guy ultimately was cut down by Caracalla's guards, and the man who had put him up to the murder, Macrinus, the Praetorian prefect, then rose to become emperor for a minute. However, Macrinus's usurpation was deeply resented by the legions, and after dealing with Macrinus for several months, they were willing to listen to the pleas of Julia Domna's sister, Julia Misa, who argued that the legions should go back to supporting the Severan dynasty. And so, about half a year or so after Caracalla's murder, his distant cousin Elagabalus became emperor at the age of 14. The downfall of Macrinus and restoration of the Severan dynasty was unprecedented. Never before had the Roman legions met with a woman and agreed to overthrow an emperor and install her grandson. It's especially notable since the legions understood that her grandson would require a regency which would mostly consist of his grandmother and his mother. So the Roman legions actually in effect did accept the rule of some Syrian women who were relatives of Septimius Severus's wife. That is exactly how influential Julia Misa was and how persuasive she was. Her oldest grandson was Elagabalus, who was only 14 at the time of his ascension, and I think it's safe to say that he is the oddest emperor in Roman history, and I don't think it's that close. Elagabalus was fully Syrian, and he was also very, very religious. However, his religion was different than that of his Roman subjects. He was a member of the cult of Elagabal which was a Syrian sun god, and one of the ways in which someone could honor Elagabal was by engaging in orgies that included both men and women. Elagabalus, of course, not only was a devotee of this god, but was also hitting puberty right around this time, and so he was very horny. So you can imagine that the idea of it being possible to improve the world through orgies and having a high sex drive as a teenager collided and produced an emperor who, according to the Historia Augusta, spent the vast majority of his time engaged in orgies. Now, that sounds rather unusual, but perhaps the Romans would have been willing to tolerate it. For the most part, the Romans were actually very tolerant of new and unusual religions, so long as the older, more traditional religions were also respected, and as long as Jupiter Optimus Maximus was re recognized as the chief god of Rome. So where Elagabalus really screwed up is that as he came of age and began to really exercise power and assert himself, 
he began to attack some of Rome's most sacred traditions. He effectively pulled an Akhenaten, but while covered in far more bodily fluids. Elagabalus went forward with outraging public opinion at Rome by trying to introduce Elagabal as the new chief god of the Roman pantheon in, in place of Jupiter Optimus Maximus. That was really asking a lot of his people. And this was the kind of thing that almost certainly would have eventually led to an assassination. And then he decided to go just a step farther by declaring that Elagabal's consort was an eastern goddess of some sort. Well, that's also bad. If he had tried to marry Elagabal, say, an existing Roman deity, such as Venus, then maybe he could have gotten away with this just barely. And then he compounds things even more by trying to really undermine Rome's traditional religion and hook and link it in with his system by marrying a Vestal Virgin, a woman who is from a noble family who was dedicated to virginity for a long set period of time. And his reason for marrying a Vestal was so that his children would then have some divine qualities. So that's something that no one had ever really thought before, that Vestal Virgins were capable of bearing children with divine qualities. And so at this point, public opinion is deeply outraged because there's one way to really alienate people. It is to attack their religion. He could have just kept doing the orgies and kept his mouth shut, and he probably could have kept doing that for years, as long as the armies continued to win battles, but he just had to go out and do what he did. Julia Misa, his grandmother, apparently was not exactly what we'd call the most loving or supportive grandparent. And so when she noticed that Elagabalus was unpopular, she decided to ask him to adopt his cousin, Severus Alexander, as his Caesar. By this point, Severus Alexander was about 14, so he's also nearing the age of manhood, and was a somewhat viable backup. Elagabalus, however, while he agreed to his grandmother's request, had no intentions of leaving his empire to his cousin, and actually decided eventually that his cousin was a threat to his power. And so, he decided to go before the Praetorian Guard and ask them to officially strip Severus Alexander of his power. But instead, the Praetorian Guard decided that Elagabalus was too much of a one-man freak show for their liking, and so instead, they killed him and then had Severus Alexander ascend to be the senior emperor. There's also a very high chance that Julia Misa understood that this would happen. On the right is a bust of Elagabalus, and as you can see from this portrait, he his statue looks a little different than most. He was too young to have an actual beard, but it looks like he was trying to grow out his facial hair, but it was a bit thin. Um, it looks like he has a little bit of a starter mustache and maybe a bit of a unibrow. So this is not someone who gives off the typical impression of a Roman emperor. Um, and actually, when he was murdered, his body was thrown unceremoniously into the Tiber. Uh, which was also very unusual and is an indication that basically everyone was done with him. This also indicates not only that the Senate hated him, but also that the people hated him, and this was something that helped the people and Senate bond, one of those rare occasions, throwing Elagabalus' body into the Tiber. So whatever else you might say about Elagabalus, he did bring people together, and not just for orgies. When he was thrown into the Tiber, he was succeeded by his cousin Severus Alexander. Severus Alexander would rule for 13 years, and basically, by the advice of his grandmother, who would soon thereafter die and be replaced by uh, Severus' mother, he would attempt to rule in a very traditional fashion. So he effectively would try to be a princeps in the old way. He eschewed any forms of pretension, and he acted like he was just another senator. And it looks like he was something of a weak personality in many ways. He was not all that charismatic, but he was dutiful, and he tried his best to not stamp on anyone's toes. He seems to have gotten along well enough with the Senate, 
But one problem that Severus Alexander had is that he forgot the lesson of his cousin, or I guess cousin-in-law, Septimius Severus, to heed the soldiers and hold and contempt all others, because he forgot to think about the soldiers' feelings. So, at one point, he made a rational decision to pay tribute to a group on the outside that was attempting to invade Rome, rather than fighting them, because he figured it would be cheaper, but his men took this as an insult to their fighting ability, and as an expression of his lack of belief in their abilities. So, taking offense, they murdered him. And this would set in motion the so-called third century crisis. So, what exactly was the third century crisis? We're not going to go into detail on it, but I think it is worth considering just for a moment. Traditionally speaking, the period from 235, when Severus Alexander was assassinated, until the rise of the Tetrarchy under Diocletian and his three colleagues in 284, has been called the third century crisis. More recent scholars do not like this label, as they point out that the people living in this period did not necessarily know that they were a part of an extended crisis, and also that by its very definition the word crisis can hardly describe the state of affairs over a 50-year period. All that's well and fair. What I would say, however, is that if we understand the third century crisis as a legitimacy crisis, then we don't necessarily need to think of it in the same way we would think of a house fire as being a crisis. A legitimacy crisis is a slow-moving thing, and it can linger for a long period of time before it is resolved. So I think if we look at it as just an intense legitimacy crisis, then the label of third century crisis can still work. During this period, what happened is that Rome generated, it seemed like, about at least one emperor per year for 50 years, and no one imperial contender was able to establish himself for very long before he was either murdered by his own men for failing to live up their expectations, he happened to be defeated by another conqueror and put to death, he happened to die in a plague, or he was killed fighting against a foreign invasion. So there are many, many emperors during this period, including two gentlemen appointed by the Senate named Pupianus and Balbinus. And none of them were really able to establish their power for long. Rome at this time was effectively going through a more intense version of what had happened to the empire under Marcus Aurelius, where the frontiers were under a good deal of pressure from outside groups, while major plagues were breaking out here and there. Uh, Cyprian's plague broke out around 250, for instance, and that was a pretty bad one. Because the Romans thought that these misfortunes were being visited upon them by the gods, they began to look for explanations, and looking for explanations sometimes involves looking for scapegoats. Before, when the Romans had persecuted Christians, it was never really systematic. A lot of it was based on Roman governors responding to complaints by local citizens about the Christians and then just going after a handful of them to keep the local elites satisfied. In this case, however, we had emperors who ordered empire-wide, or at least the parts of the empire that they held, to actually actively pursue Christians. And this will be the first and only time that that will be the case. The idea, of course, was that if you kill the impious, in this case the Christians, then you will regain the favor of the gods and Rome will settle down under a single emperor and keep all outside groups out of its borders. However, the real cause was not religious, but rather political. At heart, as we have discussed on several occasions, Rome's military system and its political system was effectively just a military dictatorship. And the problem with a military dictatorship is that it can only be stable when you have someone who is already in power and has enough success that no one wants to challenge him. But all of the contenders for power were struggling. None of them were able to restore order to the empire as a whole. 
And in fact, things got bad enough that at one point, around 260, the Roman Empire actually temporarily split into three, with a lot of the East going under Palmyra, and a lot of the West joining what was called the Gullic Empire. The main person who managed to prevent the Empire from breaking apart was a man named Aurelian, who only ruled for five years, and yet managed to defeat both Palmyra and the Gallic Empire. His coin is featured on the screen. The Roman Empire would eventually recover from the 3rd century crisis and go on to last for another couple hundred years, but it was never really the same. It was never as vibrant, it was never as powerful as before. And also, a lot of its traditional culture had been lost and would never really be recovered. To give but one example, Rome had largely been fairly easygoing when it came to sexuality for most of its history. But after the 3rd century crisis, Roman writers are very prudish, very judgmental, very uncomfortable with sexuality. They also tend not to have much of a sense of humor, if any. Um, almost all the Roman literature, and also I guess the Greek literature from the Roman period, that occurs after the 3rd century crisis is very bitter. Uh, it's acrimonious. It's not fun. There's no, there's no life in it. The scholarship becomes very stilted, very backward looking. Rome just really isn't the same. And it's hard to exactly explain if you haven't really dealt with the materials in great detail, but just the fundamental mood of Rome, the fundamental mindset, just goes through a major shift after this 50-year crisis. So in many ways, you can argue that for all practical intents and purposes, the Roman Empire ends with the 3rd century crisis and the Middle Ages begin. And in fact, there are people who want to make that argument, but a lot of them low-key just want to make that argument because then they have far more sources to read and they don't have to deal with the specter of beginning with the Dark Ages. But I digress. That is my lecture on the High Roman Empire when Rome was at its pinnacle and how Rome came to start the decline under the Severans and with the out onset of the 3rd century crisis. Next time I will discuss the culture of the High Empire.